So, um, Tampere University of Technology uh, is located in Finland, about 170 kilometers north of Helsinki, and they conduct research in fields of technology and architecture. Uh, TUT, or Tem which, uh, which is the acronym for Tempera University of Technology, is internationally recognized for its ex expertise in railway engineering, and there is a long history of research on railway track structures. Their program focuses on topics that include subsoil stability, sleepers, rails, and wheel-rail contact, among other things. The primary emphasis is on experimental field and lab research, complemented by analytical modeling of the performance of track structure. Much of the railway research at Tempera is conducted in collaboration with the Finnish Transport Agency, the administrator of the Finnish Rail Network. This seminar will provide an overview of railway track structure research at Tempera and will provide an update on two research projects uh, related to turnouts and train track interaction. Our speakers today are Riku Varas and Tia Loponen. Riku is a researcher and PhD student at Tempera. He's a member of the Railway Research Group in the Department of Civil Engineering and has over 10 years of experience collaborating with the Finnish Transport Agency. Mr. Vadas also has also worked on the FTA um, during 2014 to 2016 as a superstructure specialist, and during that time he was also a member of the Nordic Superstructure Group. He has over six years of experience in the field of track superstructure and is focused on the design and performance of turnouts. Since 2011, he's been working on a number of research projects concerning elasticity, vibrations, and safety of the turnout structure. As I said, also speaking is Tia Loponen. She's a project researcher and PhD student and also a member of the Railway Track Structures Research Teamworks at Tempera. Since 2012, her work has been on modeling and simulation of railway vehicle track interaction. Ms. Loponen and her team have over 10 years of collaboration, also with the Finnish Transport Agency and it has had a strong impact on the development of improved track regulations and instructions in Finland. During her time at Tempera, Ms. Loponen has worked as a project manager on numerous research projects concerning multi-body dynamic modeling of track train track interaction, including verification of multi-body vehicle models. Please join me in welcoming uh, Riku and Tia. They're going to talk about railway track superstructure research at Tempera University in Finland. <clears throat> so thank you, Professor Pargon, and we wish to welcome you all to this Hay seminar. And we could probably talk, uh, Professor kind of introduces us quite firmly, so I don't know how much more we can say, but let's start about, because we want to buy your interest, so we want <laughs> to give you chocolate in this talk, so it's, it's more informal. So Finnish, Finnish chocolate, best in Finland, best in Finland. So we have bought chocolate from Finland. So, so you can the best chocolate in the world. Yeah, in yeah. My so, so, in so my best opinion. chocolate in in Finland and also in the world. Yeah. Take some and. It's way better than Hershey. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Which are quite not not so good. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah, but here is our uh, basic knowledge. As, but this is something that Chris also al already mentioned. So we have we have been PhD. We have our, our we are now PhD students, and we have had our master since 2012. Both of us. And now I'm working as a research scientist and doctoral student in Tampere, Uni Tampere uh, University of Technology. And I have firmly uh, worked at the Finnish Transport Agency as a supervisor specialist two years. Yeah. So we have pretty much the same background with Riku. We have brought, made our master thesis in, in the Department of Mechan Mechanical Engineering. My, my major was Applied Mechanics and Riku's was uh, Mechanical Design. And after that, we both uh, are working in the Department of Civil Engineering. So this is the outline of today's presentation. First, I will give you, give you some introduction about Tampere and Tampere University of Technology. 
then Rico will tell you something about our track structure research team at TUT. I will tell you about my research area, this is the vehicle track interaction. And then Riku will tell you about his research area, which is the turnout. So first about Tampere. I think some of you might know Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland. And Tampere is pretty close to Helsinki. So Helsinki is in here in the coastline. And Tampere is pretty much a two hours drive north from Helsinki. It's a very nice city which is located between two big lakes. So we have a lot of uh, coastline in, in Tampere. Tampere is the third largest city in Finland. A bit over 200,000 citizens there. And it has been noticed to be the most popular city to study in Finland. So it's really a good place to study. Uh, Tampere University of Technology is going to be combined with University of Tampere in 2019. So Tampere Kolme is a combination of three different universities in Tampere. There's also this Tampere University of Applied Sciences. And together we will have 35,000 students and about 5,000 employees. But now, for a few months still, uh, Tampere University of Technology is still its own place with about 1,600 employees and almost 8,000 students. Then I will tell you some basic knowledge of the Finnish rail network. So the length of the whole network is mm -hmm almost 6,000 kilometers. Uh, so not so much as <laughs> you have here <laughs> in the United States, but pretty much compared to the size of Finland. Most of our network is single track, which is quite a challenging situation, but we have to deal with it. And track, all of the track is owned by the Finnish transport agency. So the situation is very different than what you have here. You can see in these pictures, uh, this is a picture of, of concrete sleepers and wooden sleepers in Finland. We say sleeper and that means tie, but we, uh, we have used to use the word sleeper in Europe, so you will hear it a lot during this presentation. So most of our track is a concrete sleeper track. And the axle weights of our track, you can see in the picture here in right, most of our track has an axle weight, maximum axle weight of 225 kilonewtons. But some of the, some of the track uh, can bear a 250 kilonewtons axle weights. Those tracks are here in south. Uh, this is a track from Vainikkala to Helsinki and Vuosaari. And it comes from Rusland. So there's a pretty heavy uh, freight wagons coming from Rusland to, to Finland. So we have a lot of, lot of Russian wagons uh, using the Finnish track. Uh, the problem with that is that the track gauge in Finland is 1524, but in Russia it's 1520. So there's a four millimeters difference. Uh, so the Finnish trains are made for the gauge 1524, but the Russian freight wagons are made for the gauge 1520. And that four millimeters difference is causing a lot of challenges in our research. Uh, we, we use these European rail profiles. Uh, the most common is 60E1. Uh, 
we have been uh, making a lot of collaboration with the Finnish Transport Agency. So most of our funding comes from the Finnish Transport Agency. We have had three different uh, long-term research programs with the Finnish Transport Agency. Uh, this is an ongoing project, a research program from 2017 to 2020. We also have, have some small-scale collaboration with the industry, of course, and also with the EU and some other universities. But our main collaboration is with Finnish Transport Agency. Then something about our, our railway research group. Uh, our project manager is called Heikki Luomala. And we also have three professors working with the field of railways. So Pauli Kolisaja is probably a familiar name to some of you. And we also have Tim Lansivara and Ansi Laaksonen. Uh, Tim Lansivara is a professor in subsoil group and Ansi Laaksonen in bridge group. In our track group, we have uh, seven seven people working uh, under our pro project manager and our, our professor, Pauli Kolisaja. And we also have five people in our subsoil group and three people in the bridge group who are working with uh, also roads, but, but also with, with railroads. And then we also have some research assistants. Here's a picture of our research group. So you can see Professor Ko Kolisoja here. Uh, this is our, our boss, Heikki Luomala. And this is our safety guy. When you go to the track, we have a watchman who is working in, in our department. So we always make all these arrangements with him when we go to do some measurements in a truck. And those are the other researchers in our group. You will hear about their work as well. Yeah, I can tell you about <coughs> Okay. I can tell you about more about research program what we have now. So it's called life cycle cost efficient maintenance of traffic traffic infrastructure. It's in Finnish, it's called Eteva. It makes more sense in Finland, that topic. And <coughs> it, it has started last year and it's ending in 2020. And the topics are kind of related to, of course, uh, in uh, uh, superstructure, but also in embankment and foundation. So there is top layer, middle layer and bottom layer. And all of these research are done under the big project Eteva. And all of these projects are combined together in a life cycle way. So we're trying to think all of these research as a, as a how we can prove the life cycle of all of these components. Uh, we can talk about a little bit uh, the project. So here is the Tia's project, but he can tell you, she can tell you more them in a minute. So I can skip this and here is my my project, but I can tell you more about this also. But then Tommy's project, so Tommy is our uh, sleeper guy, I can say. And he is the biggest project, what he is now dealing is the concrete sleeper replacing wooden sleeper. So as you probably know, I don't know, but as you probably know, the, mo uh, the EU legislation in, in Europe and also in here we eventually deny use of creosote as an impregnating e agent. So we cannot use creosote anymore. It's dangerous in, in wooden sleepers. So we have to think something else. And most of our sleepers are wooden sleepers in wo low volume tracks. So our main lines are in concrete, but we have still, as you see, quite many wooden uh, tracks. So one solution is to replace wood with concrete. Yeah, of course you say that concrete sleeper is stiffer. Yes, that's one big thing, and it, that's true. But uh, uh, and of course, it, if it one way it's stiffer, uh, the individual concrete sleeper may carry more loads than its hold. So when 
when there is next to that, there is a wooden sleeper, of course, the concrete sleeper carries all the loads and wooden sleeper doesn't, does nothing. But if we are trying, as we are trying now to study, study the softer pads, so we are putting softer pad underneath the rail to kind of compensate the stiffness of the uh, concrete sleeper. And we are also trying to make a wooden sleeper, uh, the dimension on the, on the wooden sleeper and made the concrete sleeper same size. They are a little bit not so strong than the normal concrete sleepers. And we are making full scale test as you can see there is wooden sleepers and concrete sleepers installed quite many ways and this is now ongoing project to let's see how it goes different kind of sleeper we have installed. Then the drainage, Juha Latvala is doing the drainage work <coughs> and of course the role of drainage is quite important in geometric problems and we are doing all, all kinds of lab tests and full scale we have three uh, lab uh, test site where we can monitor different kind of drainage situations so there is quite wet, there is moderate wet and this is completely dry to measure how, it, how the drainage affects all things. And then our boss Heikki Luomala is doing his researches about track stiffness and the development of track condition evaluation methods. So of course too, too low track stiffness causes ballast degradation, embankment widening, fatigue of superstructure components, so really big problems if the stiffness is wrong. And too high stiffness of course it's more loads. And we have, the Heikki has designed his own uh, measuring device, we cannot say car, but measuring device. It's not car because it's so small and yeah, but, uh, but uh, base, it's based on the vertical geometry measurement. So we are actually measuring uh, the load, uh, the geometry underneath the load. We can use light locomotive where there is about 15 tons uh, axle weight or the loaded wagon when there is 20 22.5 tons axle load. So different kind of axle loads, we can measure the uh, geometry underneath that. And then there is another wheels where we can uh, measure the unloaded geometry. So when we are comparing the unloaded uh, geometry and the loaded ge geometry, we can get the, uh, the kind of uh, the deflection between them. And that is kind of the stiffness. It's not really the stiffness, but it's compared to stiffness. And then we have had a completely 3D model of the whole track. So there is track and uh, all the ballast and the embankment, all the substructures and all. Of course, we need this to examine how the, all the things are affecting each other. But this is not my, my work, so, so I'm not going to talk about more. And then Mikko is doing, because we are, of course, in every country, we are measuring a lot. It's really big data amount when we are measuring. But no, nobody can say that what we can do without, with that measuring data. We have so much measuring data all the, all the day. We are measuring that and that and that. And nobody really knows how to combine this. How to, if we have measured something in the substructure and we, and we have measured something at the track, how to combine this? So Mikko has done uh, uh, mining, data mining. So how this, all of this data can be compressed to one knowledge, how all the things are affecting each other. So it's pretty, com pretty complex mathematical models, how the all things affecting each other. But great work he has done. Then I can give Kia a chance to talk about his research. Yeah, so <coughs> my research topic is the vehicle track interaction and its dynamic modeling. Why am I doing this kind of research? Well, the Finnish Transport Agency is our main funder and it has a big interest on the track condition because the FDA owns the track. So they want to know what kind of track loads uh, different kind of trains are causing. And of course, I think in most of the countries there is a continuous need to increase both train speed and the axle loads. And both of those actions are increasing the track loads. And when the track loads are increasing, they of course cause 
uh, problems to the tra structure, so more irregularities and stuff like that. And when the track is damaged, it also causes problems to the trains. So uh, when the track gets worse, the train movement is not as optimal as it should be, and the wheel ray contact gets worse also. So there is like this uh, negative cycle when the other part gets worse, also the other one gets worse. So you should always think both of both of the sides, the track and the trains. So the wheel to track interaction is is my my subject. Uh, I'm doing uh, vehicle models and simulations because this is a very effective way to study the the different methods that we can uh, make to decrease the track loads. So we can study both track parameters and, and the vehicle parameters with the vehicle models. Basically what I am doing, uh, I have this software called Vampire, which is a, a multi-body dynamic software. Uh, there are many softwares like that but I am using this one. Uh, the basic idea is that you build a vehicle model and then you build a model of the track. And the models are based on, on uh, masses combined with stiffness and damping components. Uh, what is the information that you need to give to the software? When you have a software like that, which is concentrated on the uh, vehicle track interaction and the contact between wheel and rail, you need to give the information about the wheel and rail profiles. You also need to give the information about the track parameters, so the track stiffness, the track geometry, the track irregularities, and also the vehicle parameters. What is the speed of the vehicle? what is the structure of the vehicle, what kind of masses and stiffness and damping components is there in the vehicle. And what can you get from the simulations? You can get the displacements, velocities and the accelerations in different parts of the train. You can also get the wheel forces, so the forces acting between the wheel rail. And you can get tau gamma values. I'm not sure if you are familiar with tau gamma, but it tells you about the wear, which is happening between the wheel and rail. And then you also get the wheel rail contact information, which is a very, very important information to get, because pretty much everything depends on the contact between wheel and rail. We have four different vehicle models at TUT. <coughs> we have two passenger cars and two freight wagons. The passenger cars are, uh, one is a double-decker and one is a single-decker passenger car. Those are the most common uh, passenger cars in Finland. And we also have two freight wagons. One is a Finnish raw timber wagon, which is the most common uh, freight wagon in Finland. And then one is a Russian freight wagon. We always need to consider also the Russian freight wagons because there's so many of them using the Finnish uh, truck. I will tell you about the research project projects that I have been mainly involved in TUT. So the first one, uh, this was my master's thesis. So it's about the det detachment of snow from the rolling stock at rail discontinuity discontinuities. We have many problems with snow during winter times in Finland and this is a pretty usual situation. This is a train underframe and there is quite a lot of ice under the train. So the problem what my master's thesis was based on is that when there are trains like this and then they drive 
to the turnout. There is a discontinuity point in a turnout, which causes quite a lot of accelerations to the train. So when you get those accelerations, it's like an oxidation to the train, and some of these ice drops from the bottom of the, of the train. And in some unfortunate cases, the ice ends up between the, the stock rail and the switch blade in the turnout. And so after that, you cannot move, move the blade and <coughs> the switch is pretty much useless. Turnouts are useless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we have some heating systems in turnouts, but the power in them is not enough to, to get rid of it, these ice blocks in like a few minutes. It takes hours. So we need to figure out uh, are there some, some uh, specific trains that cause these problems? Are some specific trains uh, having the most of the ice in the underframe? So that is why we installed some, some cameras in a couple of turnouts that were the most problematic turnouts. And we watch how much snow or ice are getting to the turnout area. So these are the pictures. And we also put some, some video cameras uh, under a train to get a picture of the train under frame, to get some idea how the snow is getting in the bottom of the train. We also put some accelerators to find out the accelerations that different kind of turnouts are causing to the train. Then we had this project about the effect of rail clearance change on train movement and track forces. This project was based on those Russian freight wagons because they have the uh, lower distance between the fans contact faces. So as you can see, here is the distance between fans contact faces. And in Finland, the distance is 1510 and in Russia it's 1506. So a four millimeters difference. We made some simulations to find out uh, how does this difference affect the loads between wheel and track. This was pretty much our main project in recent years. Uh, it's a rolling stock track interaction and it's dynamic modeling. This was like a two years project and we wanted to figure out how different parameters affect the track loads. So we changed some parameters in the track and we changed some parameters in the vehicle mod models. So based on that, we got some basic knowledge about the parameters and, and their sensitivity on, on changes. Uh, equivalent conicity is, is one of my favorite <laughs> subjects, but I don't think we have <laughs> enough time to get into this. So I just skip this. But please, we can have some discussions if some, someone else is inter interested in that subject. Uh, we verified our, our vehicle models by stationary eigenmode analysis. So this was one project. We uh, made some eigenmode analysis to our vehicle models that we had built. And then we got these real vehicles and measured their eigenmodes as well and we compared those, those values that we got from the models and those that we got from the real vehicles. And based on that, 
we made some changes in the parameters. This is the flowchart of the verification pro process. An ongoing project that we have now is the effect of rail sideware on train derailment risk and the convenience of train passengers. The convenience of train passengers is a very important subject in Finland. Many people are, are using train and we want in Finland that when you use train, you can drink coffee in a train so that it doesn't split. So it has to be very smooth ride. <laughs> so that is why we always have to consider also the accelerations in passenger cars. So that the accelerations don't get too high. Uh, the current rail sideware limits in Finland are pretty conservative. And we wanted to figure out what would happen if we would make those limit values higher. Because that would get us some great economical benefits. Because we wouldn't need to uh, make rail grinding that often. But of course we need to figure out if it, changed, if it changed those limit values, what would happen? The worst case, of course, is the train derailment, which is quite far, in my opinion, but we have to look at it as well. But the main subject in this is to find out how change in rail sideware limits would affect the convenience of train passengers, so the accelerations. Now I will give Riku a chance to tell about his book. Okay, <coughs> and check the watch, so I have six minutes, okay? <laughs> <coughs> okay, I can tell you about turnout research at TUT. Uh, as you maybe heard, uh, I don't know how much you use the word turnout, but you have maybe used more the special track work, so that's the same as turnouts. And I don't know how much do you know about turnouts, so there is question about it, but turnout is here. Turnout is old. Oh, this is turnout. One big turnout. No, there is lots of different things, but this is turnout. So ways to uh, move the car from one, one track to another. So all the things which are concerning that movement. And turnout can be also a structure where the two tracks intersect each other without possibility to change track, so crossing. But technically, that all thing at the picture. So, so this is turnout, so there is a switch area where the switching is happening, then the closer area and the middle part, crossing area where the actual the rail cross and the end part. But this all, I can talk about turnouts. Turnout and switch are different because if I'm talking about switch, it's just here and the turnout is the whole structure, so turnout includes crossing. Uh, here is the, some terms which I'm going to use, so stock rail, switch blade, a crossing part, so these are the most important, so switch blade which are moving, then the, then the stock rail and also the crossing part which is causing a lot of problem. <coughs> then the main topics in our uh, turnout research, so the turnout research was started when I got into TUT, so there was no, no one has done e anything before me, so I'm the first turnout researcher in Finland. Here are the, all the uh, projects that I, I have done since 2011, and we can look at those. So this is my master thesis, this was the turning point of my life. <laughs> uh, my master thesis uh, project which aims was to examine, examine uh, how the rolling stock uh, induced lateral vibration affects to the opening risk of the turnout. So we have one, we had one turnout derailment in Toyala, is in picture, uh, where the uh, turnout opened uh, underneath the moving train. So, so the situation where that, that the uh, first part of the train 
goes that direction and the end part goes that direction. And as you can see, there is woods, so the end part goes in the woods. <coughs> uh, and that was quite big problem because we are afraid that the lateral vibration was the cause of that opening. So we, I, so my master thesis was pr probably the, uh, the measurement that how big vibration there is at the switch plate, at the stock rail, and all the point machine. And so we measured the point, uh, the deflex, uh, the settlement, and when then we uh, measured the movement of the switch plate and the vibration in switch plate and the stock rail. And the conclusion was that there was many very minor lateral vibration, so that was not the cause. But the actual cause was that the, uh, the flangeway clearance was not big enough in that, in that turnout before that derailment. This is completely new turnout after the accident, and there is enough clearance now. So we haven't had any problems with the clearance, but I know that the old turnout, which was the derailment turnout, there was two minor clearance in here. So the Russian wagons, which are narrow, they can hit the open switchblade. And when they are hitting the open switchblade, no turnout can handle that one. Because, they, of course, it's infinite uh, loads if the, if, the turn, uh, if the wheel is hitting here. So it can really open this point machine. So point machine is here in the top, uh, at the tip. And then there is, we, can, we use this kind of uh, spring device at the heel of the turnout, which helps the heel of the turnout turn. So we don't n use another point machine. We have just these kind of uh, spring devices there. Uh, so in the, in the place of the uh, spring device, the flangeway is at the smallest. So it was really problem how to adjust this spring device to get this clearance enough. And the finding was that uh, the finding led to a situation where all the point machines, also in short turnouts like this, were changed to non-trailable versions. So they cannot be trailed anymore. In, in past days, we can trail because if, if you are uh, going to the uh, turnout and you are going to another direction, what we should be, the turnout turns as a safety procedure. But of course, when there is a possibility to turn, they also can turn underneath the train. So we deny that possibility. So not anymore, the turnouts cannot open, even if we have to broke the turnout to open it. But in the, in 19th, the situation was that if we drove slowly at the turnout and it, it is in wrong direction, it slowly turns in the right direction and nothing really broke. But now, nowadays it broke. I, yeah. I think with in the United States vernacular, I think with this, what we would call a spring switch. Yeah, okay, yeah. So you use these kind of spring devices. Yeah, okay. And then we have uh, detection failures, signaling system, uh, failures in signaling systems caused by the train passage. So we are afraid that in long turnouts where the speeds are really uh, big, uh, the vibration is so big that the detection system gives uh, as error signals that it has been trailed, the turnout has been trailed. So it has turned underneath the train. But if we are looking at the turnout, nothing has actually turned. So the signaling system gives us really short, short signal, which indicates that the point machine has been tra temporarily trailed. So previously, these signals has just been ignored to have uh, some kind of errors in the detection systems. But we have that one uh, accident in Toyala and another accident in Vammala where the train actually derailed. So you can, nobody can say that there are some error signals in the detection system. We cannot care them. So we have to take something, we ha have to kind of examine the signals. Is there something really important in those signals, those, those short signals? So we uh, measure the one, one, one to twen uh, 26 turnout in Hakosilta, so one meter side and 26 meters ahead. So that's the crossing race ratio. And which is the most problematic uh, turnout in Finland causing these false alarms. And conclusion was that quite big vibrations were exerted in the point machine during train passage. So whole point machine was shaking when the, when the Russian wagon, not the Finnish wagon, but the Russian wagon, I don't want to blame the Russians, <laughs> but they are causing all our problems. <coughs> uh, so. 
in this type, type of high speed turnout, so high speed, the, the speed is 200. So it's not really high speed. Well, I don't know how, who to ask, but for my, me, it's not really high speed, but it's the highest speed in Finland. So when I'm going quite uh, high speed, there is quite big uh, vibrations. No, well, not the freight wagons are not going 200 miles, 200 kilometers per hour, but still. So the vibration is big and it's causing, uh, as you can see, here is the uh, accelerometer result. And here is the uh, time frame where the actual the trailing happens. So really short signal, but as you can see, there is really big uh, accelerations in the moment of trailing signal. So there is two big uh, vibrations in that point machine box. So the de detection system should be re re designed because it shakes when the train passes. It shakes so we can't handle that uh, vibration. So it should be changed, but nothing, has, nothing yet has been done. I don't know why. My word is not big enough if I say that you should change them, but I'm just one person in Finland. <coughs> so bigger bosses have to say the same. So I'm teaching them. <coughs> Then I have complications of vertical stiffness of, of rail, uh, Finnish railway turnouts and its countermeasures. So FT have struggled years with the different kind of failures in, in turnouts and, we, and the biggest problems is related to the vertical stiffness. So vertical stiffness is causing us quite many problems and that's because our uh, normal turnout structure is rather stiff. There is no actual uh, elastic pad in this structure. So there is just four, four millimeter cork, cork elastomer pad underneath the uh, switch blade, uh, switch pad, but the base, pla base blade, sorry, base blade. Underneath that is just four millimeter pad with, which is really stiff. So, so it's really stiff the structure and it's causing us problems. As you can see, there is a reversible de uh, deflection or elasticity. Uh, in the turnout area and it's really big difference in the turnout area. The deflection is changing a lot in normal. We uh, measured eight different turnouts and we give uh, and the results was quite awful. So we designed new turnout as simple as that. Uh, in 2012 uh, Finnish transport agency started to develop that and I was involved and here is the old uh, fastening systems in the switch area and it, this is the new one. So proper elastic pad underneath the base plate, there is angle guided plates which can take care of the uh, lateral movements here because the screws were also breaking because it cannot handle the lateral forces. But when they have now the angle guided plates, they can handle the lateral forces also. So we have no, not any more the screw problems. And the biggest uh, changes what does we that we use the uh, elastic pad underneath every fastening and then we use the angle guide plates we also used a uh, hollow bearer so all the actuator rods goes inside the bearer so we can damp that that uh, better that whole sleeper we cannot damp the area where the uh, rods are going inside the ballast so if it is going on in inside the sleeper we can damp that of course we have inclination straight at the uh, uh, sleeper. In the turnout area, it's not normal to have inclination straight in the sleeper, but we designed the whole new sleeper design where the inclination is there, so we don't use metal parts anymore. So we don't have any more parts. It's a little bit cheaper to use that kind of. After, of course, the redesigning was quite expensive, but now when, when we have that sleeper, it's cheap to us. Not even though, of course, the sleeper company doesn't think so we are thinking that this is the best solution. And then the undersleeper pads, of course, we test the undersleeper pads underneath the turnout. And here is the comparison. So this is the old turnout and here is the new turnout, the same measurement. So the, this is error. This is measurement error. So you cannot watch this, but here is the, here is the section in the, uh, in the uh, turnout area where you can see it's more more smooth than in here because we have that elastic pad, so there is no change anymore. And these are three years after installation, two years, so this is happening quite fast. 
this kind of fluctuation. Of course, we have disadvantage. So new structure, the hollow sleepers are really wide and our old damping machine cannot handle it quite well. So we, use, we have to use quite new damping machine to handle that wide sleeper. So old machines cannot open so wide. And the prototype turnouts include heating, uh, sleeper heating. So we need heating inside the sleeper to rods to work. Uh, it was 300 uh, watts, but it was not enough. So we need maybe more. So, but we have to uh, heat more when we have that uh, hollow sleeper. And the adjustment of the outer locking system, why we are using now outer locking, outer locking systems in the new turnout. It is not so precise that the inner locking systems what we used before, so that's one problem. And the turnouts are elements are heavier, so we cannot lift them. Uh, we, uh, in, formal, in, in short turnouts, we can lift two elements at a time straight to the track. But now we, are ha we have to uh, lift them one by one because they are heavier, a little bit heavier. So we are assembling all the turnouts in the factory and then just moving them in track. So we are not assembling the turnouts in track because that would be quite time spending. <coughs> uh, and then we of course have a uh, little bit measured the under sleeper pads, just the under sleeper pads underneath the turnout. So as a part of the development work, uh, FDA wanted to install the two conventional turnout equipped with under sleeper pads. So old structure, but under the under sleeper pads. It's going from Helsinki city to airport. There's a new line called ring, ring, ring rail line. So in there, there was two new uh, turnouts and there is also uh, two old turnouts next to them. So we can compare them. And here is the, uh, here is the deflection uh, in flexion, uh, when there is no, there is no uh, undersleeper pad and there is a deflection when we have undersleeper pads. So there is big, uh, big, uh, big fluctuation where we have, don't have the undersleeper pad. So in, in long run, this is better, but, but in short run, of course, the undersleeper pad uh, uh, increases the settlement in the start, in the starting phase, of course, when we are installing it in first phase, it, uh, it settles more. And we did that kind of error that we damp this quite soon after the installation. So afterwards, we really have had good results with the underslipper pad and then we damp it and all, all was ruined because the damping, I think that it has been uh, worse after the damping because the under sleeper pad turn uh, at the ties or sleepers. And when you are using the pads, you cannot uh, damp it. Uh, you shouldn't not damp it because, because the contact between the under sleeper pad and the ballast is lost in every damping. So you don't want to do that all over again. So that was one thing we damp it too soon. <coughs> and then we have new, the, the newest pro project is, is the tamping issues. So tamping and installation issues because FDA is, is has concerns that the expertise of the tamping has disappeared in the field. So nobody really can tamp anymore the turnouts. So we should create good practice, new practices in the turnout area, how to tamp the turnout area, what is the be best practices in Finland and what practices should be denied. And hopefully we will get the new uh, regulations from FDA that how the uh, turnout should be damped in future. This is the last, last slide, so thank you. Any questions? <laughs> the measurement doesn't have to be so serious. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, this guy Tom is doing work. I'm, I'm just fooling around. So <laughs> that's the normal situation. <laughs> yeah. Do you have sun? Yeah.
have been considered. Yeah. So the question was that have, have the composite sleeper have been thought about? Yeah, uh, we have talked about the composite sleeper, but, but the situation is that FDA wants all the, uh, all the uh, sleepers to be uh, made, in made in Finland. So we ha don't have any companies in Finland making composite ties. So that's one reason why the composite tie hasn't really raised up in Finland because I don't know, there is some people who want to be Finnish based. I don't know why, but they are quite big guys. So if they are telling that we have to carry on in Finnish product, then we are just carrying on. <coughs> that, that's the reason. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm curious about these Russian cars. Yeah. So the question was why there are Russian wagons in our track. <laughs> That's a good question because <laughs> why? Uh, well, there is quite big shipments between Finland and Russia. They want us to deliver goods and of course vice versa. So we are really changing goods with Russia quite a lot. There's big factories in Finland which wants to deal with Russians. So we are, there are quite many freight wagons and there is also one passenger uh, train coming from Helsinki to Pe St. Petersburg. So one high speed train. So that's also going in that track. They also have a lot of coastline in Finland. So they want to use our airports yeah. to deliver yeah. the goods yeah. from Russia to some countries in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I understood from our conversation last week. Yeah. What Tia just said, which is that there's a lot of traffic to Finnish ports yeah. from yeah. So and that's, I think that's why mm -hmm. I saw on your map yeah. that sort of band of heavy axle of traffic. Yeah. 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 There is, there is yeah. that main line from Helsinki to Vainikkala. There is a lot of uh, Russian wagons here coming from, of, of course, in here in Tampere where we live, but also in the uh, harbors. But they are the main harbors here where the Russian wants to use. Okay, the question was that uh, how big, how third is our uh, underslipper pad design in Finland? Uh, I don't know that we don't have any underslipper pads in the main line. I think that we started it in turnouts because, because of course they are expensive. And I think that it has been thought, uh, discussion that in turnout area, the the expense is not nothing. If the long turnout cost about half a million euros, then the, uh, the USB cost is nothing. So we can put the, the underslipper pads underneath the crossing or, or the turnout. But in mainline, it has been the cost issue that it's too expensive to install them with USB. And the good things in, in the underslipper pads, they are not so good that normal main line will be installed. So we don't have any underslipper pad underneath the main line. I can say that there is, there could be some test lines, few kilometers, but that's all. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, could you repeat? How do I input? Okay. So the question was, how do I input the track irregularities in my software? Yeah. Um, we can get some measurement results from our measurement device and we can use them with some, uh, we change the values a little to fit them to our software but we can pretty much use the values that we get from the measurement device. So there is a measurement car going through the Finnish uh, rail network and we get those results 
and then we can use them as an input like for the software. So uh, your question was what kind of data I am choosing yeah. to use in my software. Well, that depends on the problem that I'm trying to simulate. Because usually the problems that we are trying to solve are in main lines. So if they are in main lines, and if they are in a specific track section, I can use the same track section to get the input data to my software. So for example, if the problems are between Helsinki and Tampere, then I use the exact data from, from that track section for my input in, in my software. Which software do you say you use for that model? I use Vampire Pro. Vampire. Yeah, Vampire. Uh, for now, I have stopped there. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so the question was, uh, when I have uh, verified my models, uh, do I do some optimization for the model parameters, or do I just s stop there? Yeah, it would be very nice to make some optimization, of course. But it depends, pretty much it depends what the FDA wants. Will they give me money for making better trains? Probably not, because they are interested in the track. So I don't think so. I don't think that it's going to happen that I could optimize the train parameters. But maybe if the uh, if the train manufacturer is interested in that kind of results, then that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the. Um Call it the base plate screw failures. Yeah. Um, are these are they suffering fatigue? I mean, is that why they're failing? I'm thinking of yeah. your problem currently. So the question was that what is the failure mode in our uh, broken screws internals? Uh, they are they are uh, it's it I I think that it's fatigue, but it's it's because I think that it's uh, quite. Uh, the reason is quite clear because we don't have any. Mm. Oh. It's not working anymore uh, because there is no uh, because this pad uh, because this plate is directly fastened to the sleeper. So I think that it's com uh, it's mostly fatigue, but I think that it could happen quite fast that the loads are just too big to handle. Lateral, because that, of course, that screw is doesn't it it, it, it isn't uh, designed to handle lateral loads, and it, it there could be quite big lateral loads because this is just designed to be used as a uh, vertical vertical uh, direction. So I think that it can happen quite fast because there is no proper fastenings. It it should use some kind of uh, lateral other kind of methods like this, like, like angle guide plates. So we can just cannot use them as some in, in main lines where the loads are quite big and the speeds are big. Yeah. Along those lines, is the lack of resiliency at least in the old system something that is more prevalent throughout Europe? I guess I'm surprised to see concrete side turnouts with less than concrete sleeper turnouts without more. Uh, what was your question? Is there more So the question was that is it fam uh, familiar in other countries that these kind of broken screws? I don't know. I think that this is the same problem in ed every country which are using this kind of uh, fastening, because I think that 
when you are using the concrete sleeper and the direct fastening, you just get the problems. We have had the problems. I don't know, I'm not sure about other countries, but I think that they have the same problems because, because this was uh, designed together with Svihag in uh, Switzerland. And they said, that, they said that this is ridiculous and you should not do this because this caused problems. So you have to use angle guided plates. So that was all thing to Svihag. Uh, I don't understand what. So the question was, uh, because we have these winter conditions yeah. in Finland, uh, how do we manage with, with all the snow? Snow in turnouts. Uh, do you have one hour? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yeah, we handle the uh, winter quite many ways, but the heating is the biggest way to handle the cold climate in Finland. So we are heating to turn out a lot. So there is quite big heating uh, elements in turnouts and you can really go, go there and warm your hands in the turnout area because it's completely out of snow. The normal turnout area is completely out of snow and there could be half a meter of snow next to it, but that's completely out of snow because we are melting the whole, whole turnout area. We also have yeah. these blowing machines. Yeah, we have now blowing machines. So we can blow the uh, snow away but it was really, really expensive. <laughs> From Japan, it's really expensive device. <coughs> but that's, what, that's what they've got in North America. Yep. If you're operating in winter climate, you've got to have very effective switch heaters. And yeah. So yeah. So are yours uh, electric? Or yeah, electric, yeah. direct electric heating elements in the stock rail and in the switch blade. So both, them, both of them are heated. Yeah. And you it's also, really... Yeah, we, we don't use, we don't use in, uh, I think that people are afraid of propane in, so we are d d using the direct, direct, but it's quite big cost. I think that 10 million euros per year is in the heating elements and in the electricity of the heating and 10 million euros in Finland just to heat things. It's quite big <laughs> amount of money. <coughs> Imagine you spend a lot of money on heating in Finland in general. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we have quite good heating systems in Finland because we need that mu did not that so much. But in track, it's it's going away. All the heat is going away, so we should need some okay. kind of barrack. Yeah, wasting yeah. energy. It's it's waste, yeah. of course. The, most of the heat is waste. Maybe you can get some of that cheap Russian natural gas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that would be one solution. Yeah, but of course there is uh, also mechanical cleaning of the turnouts, of course. That's nice. And man work is cheap. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention in all the discussion about the terminology. So yeah. you know you, what you call the crossing in your turnout. Yeah. You know what we call it. I don't know. The frog. Yeah, no, the frog <laughs> frog is I, I think that it's it's quite familiar term. I think that in, in Europe they are also, yeah. also calling it frog. Why That's, is it called frog? <laughs> well, that's yeah. an interesting set, several theories. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, but the frog is just a crossing. Uh, I can say that the frog is the uh, manganese steel crossing part. And the crossing area is all the check plates and the swing wing rails and all the things. So that's crossing. But frog is just the manganese part. <coughs> Thank you very much.